All right. Take your Bibles this morning to, uh, let's see here, where we're going to go. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And we'll start our Sunday school there. I have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you today for your goodness, for your mercy, for blessings through the week. And God, all that we uh, anticipate being done today, we just ask that you'd be... Uh, be here in a special kind of way dealing with us and or maybe bring some visitors in. Lord, in this uh, Christmas season, uh, it would seem that people might be a little bit more mindful of the Lord Jesus and his birth and life and sacrifice, but it seems like they're uh, more interested in sales at stores. God, I pray you just uh, touch hearts and uh, speak to those people that have some sense of responsibility for their soul and their future. God, help us to take the things that we learn here in Sunday school and be a blessing to those people. Lord, please bless our Sunday school teachers and their classes, the children this morning. God, accomplish something for yourself in our lives. I, I pray, God, it's uh, uh, even, even the church that professes to have the infallible book seems to have precious little interest in it at times. God, just uh, stir our hearts to have a deeper love for you, for your word, and the, the relationship you want with us. Lord, help us to be the encouraging crowd that draws people to the throne of mercy and grace to find help. And Lord, we ask your blessings on our lessons this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Ephesians chapter 1, uh, down here in verse, uh, uh, let's see here. I'm going to start reading in verse 6. Chapter 1 of Ephesians, verse 6. Just for a little bit of context here, Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, and he's reminding them some things that uh, probably they had been told and knew, but it's so uh, uh, essential to consistently and uh, constantly reinforce the truths that we know from the Scriptures. It's one thing to know them, it's something else to do them. And far too many people... Uh, just talking with Herb this morning about uh, different circumstances, have the idea that if you say the right words or, or uh, have heard them somewhere and can repeat them, that that's the same as the experience of living out that, that uh, doctrine or that truth in your life. And it's, uh, it's very uh, deceptive and delusional until it becomes part of your, your life. And verse, uh, verse 6 says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, that is, of the Lord Jesus Christ, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption, through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself." that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, on earth even in him, in whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. We're going to talk a little bit uh, this morning. I think this will probably be our last point to be made on uh, not, not the fullness of it, but certainly the last point on the relationship that we have now in Christ with the Holy Spirit. The relationship a lost man has with the Holy Spirit is one of alienation, one of separation, where the Holy Spirit can witness to people. It can provoke, provoke conscience. It can do different things. But there's the only response has to be repentance. The Bible says uh, faith towards God, repentance towards God, and faith toward Jesus Christ the Spirit uh, convicts and brings people into an understanding of that. For the saved, it's a, a, a different relationship altogether in that the minute you're saved, the Spirit of God moves in to dwell eternally with us. 
we uh, touched something here, and I want to do this because this is not uh, so much part of this particular verse, but uh, it just illustrates this. It says in verse 14, which is the earnest, this idea of sealing with the Holy Spirit. He comes and imagines uh, uh, the strongest force, power, person in the universe comes in and locks the door after they come in. And what's going to take them out? What shall separate us from the love of Christ? What what's can overpower that? Nothing. This sealing is done, and it's not done by my conviction. It isn't done by the preacher baptizing somebody. It isn't done by uh, some serious level of uh, thought or profession or getting your name on membership list. It's done by the Spirit of God. He responds to true faith. I think one of the things that we... we uh, uh, have to constantly be mindful of is we are easily deceived on who's saved and who isn't. If somebody isn't walking the way we think they should, or even the way the scripture says, our, our first uh, response might be, well, I don't think they're saved. Well, maybe that's so, maybe it isn't. But uh, if you think about yourself, and you can be honest, pretty surely there's almost in some place in your life where you've done something there wasn't anything near what God wanted to do. And you had a response to that, but I'm going to do it anyway. Or I've already done it. And you were saved, right? So it only becomes a matter of degree. How far can someone get from that truth before they, uh, uh, they are lost? Or how, how far can they be in and have a different circumstance? But it says this. Verse 14, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14, which is the earnest. This sealing of the Spirit of God is the earnest of our inheritance. And earnest, uh, uh, years ago, they used to use the expression earnest money. And that was if you were going to buy something. We would think of it today as a down payment. Uh, but it was just promissory money that I'm going to give you this. And then when I get the rest of it or when the rest of the, the circumstance fulfills itself, I'm going to give you all of the rest because this is to prove to you I am sincere. The Spirit of God comes to dwell in us because there's yet a part of man that hasn't been redeemed. There's yet a part of man that is alienated from God, and it's this flesh. Our, our soul is uh, washed in that blood. Our spirit is regenerated. We now have a living spirit of access to God. That's, uh, again, the Holy Spirit's work. But this stuff here is just waiting. But God says, I've already bought it. One of these days, I'm going to cash in, and I'm going to take my whole uh, possession there. Romans uh uh, chapter uh, 8 talks about the, the uh, creation groaning and travailing and pain together until now waiting for something. This until is that uh, we would think of it if it was to happen today, it'd be the, the rapture. If we die, it'd be the resurrection. But that's kind of one event. Just depends on which side of the dirt you're on when, uh, when that comes. But anyway... Waiting until the redemption of the purchased possession. Romans 12, 1 and 2 it talks about presenting your body as a living sacrifice. And the reason is, is because it already belongs to the Lord. It's his, it's his purchased possession. He just hasn't claimed it yet. He hasn't taken full ownership of that body yet. But we ought to give it to him as an offering. So in this, this sealing, it's something that God has done. It, it uh, regenerates. It gives something that uh, is eternal. The Bible says the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. God doesn't save somebody and then look four years down the road and say, well, they just haven't lived the way I want them to. I'm going to just throw them out. He's already given us eternal life. The, the consequence of uh, not living that life uh, we will experience but God says, you're mine. You've been bought with a price. You've been sealed. Everything that you are and going to be forever is, uh, is, is kind of sealed in you. The utility that God gets out of us, if I could use that very practical word, will determine rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. But that salvation is already intense. What this uh, sealing does, if you look at uh, Acts chapter 4, I think we talked about this in relation to something else here fairly recently. Acts chapter 4. And it's a test. How many of you know somebody who's, who's saved, just backslidden as could be, 
and you talk to them and uh, you realize when, you, when you're witnessing to them and telling them about what they ought to be doing, all they can say is yes. They know you're right. They're not going to do it, but they know you're right. You know the difference between that and a lost man? A lost man pleads his innocence. A lost man pleads, uh, well, I'm okay. I'm good. A saved man that's just backslidden will typically say, yeah, you're right. I, I know. I'm not doing what I should, not living the way I should. Because that Holy Spirit doesn't give peace to, to uh, sin. Uh, let's see here. Uh, chapter 4 and verse uh, 30. Acts chapter 4, verse 30. Uh, talking about the disciples and uh, apostles, what they were doing and their reaction to things after the uh, Spirit of God moved in them. The verse there says, By stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were uh, assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. One of the things that that sealing does is it gives people a new way of thinking about their life. You know, we sing a song every now and then, what have I to fear, what have I to dread, leaning on the everlasting arms. A lost man looks at that and he's intimidated by others. He looks at people and wants to fit in with a, with a larger crowd. A real, truly born-again child of God may have that urging, may have that feeling, and I guess in times uh, back and forth they may do that but deep down inside them they know they ought to be different than that there's that understanding and that knowledge that has been put in them and it doesn't take much bible as a matter of fact if you don't have any more bible than knowing uh, enough about jesus christ to make an honest profession of faith the holy spirit knows all about him and he can put that guilt and lay it out there until you start looking to why you feel guilty and what all that stuff is about one of the things that uh, church attendance, I was talking to somebody last night about that, is, is it's, it's the training ground of how to live the life that God has now given you. We live in a day and age where people make a profession, never, never darken the door of a church, never crack open a Bible, uh, just said, well, somebody prayed with me and told me I'm saved. Well, listen, the Bible says if you're truly saved, you would be as a newborn babe desiring the sincere milk of the word. Who could believe there's, there's an eternal, infallible God that writ, wrote a book, gave us instructions, and not have a desire to find out what's in it? You might kick and, and, and scoff at what's in there sometime, but you're going to have a desire to look at it. That's that spirit's prompting in there to, to have that hunger. He wants you to be able to, to line up with that word so he can lead you and guide you into all truth. You, you can't live the truth if you don't know what the truth is. And I think that's the, the sad testimony of, of multitudes of professing Christians today. Their character was speaking the word of God with boldness. We have, uh, I, I've seen people today, their witness is so tentative and it is so vague and it is so wishy-washy that they could talk to somebody for a half hour about church and the Lord and everything else and never once hit on any pertinent fact that has any relevance to what a lost man needs as far as getting saved. And the sad testimony of that is, is that person now think, well, I've talked to so-and-so and they're a Christian and, and I, I, I kind of agreed with everything they said. Listen, I'm, I'm not saying we, we should be offensive or have to be offensive or aggressive. But we ought to be truthful. We ought to, we ought to tell these folks things they really need to hear. Amen. That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That person you're talking to, as much as you might like them, or as intimate as your relationship is with them, is just a, a whosoever in God's book. And until they've called upon the Lord Jesus Christ, they, have, they get the same consequence of the most wicked, vile, corrupt uh, person on the face of the earth. A lake of fire is their future. We're not doing people a kindness by lacking that boldness. We're not doing people a favor by withholding those levels of truth from us. What we are afraid of is uh, uh, alienating them so they don't like us. 
But you know what? That's, that's that sort of teenage love where I love you if you love me, and if you don't, I won't like you at all. And you can't be friends with them if you're friends with me and all, you know, all that kind of, that stuff is so selfish and so self-serving and it uses people. And I think the day is coming when we're going to picture people uh, standing in front of us, whether it's at the uh, white throne judgment as they are judged for their sin or the judgment seat of Christ where we have to give an account of the things we've done in this body, whether they be good or bad. And we're going to rethink all those things. Well, I'll tell you something, my friends. Right now is a good time to rethink those things while there's still a chance to, to straighten them out or a chance to whole, have a whole different perspective on life and just make ourselves honest, make ourselves accountable. You know, the, the Bible says a, a true witness delivers souls. Well, what does a false witness do? A false witness lies. A false witness withholds a certain level of truth. And you're going to need the boldness of the Spirit of God in you to deal with anybody today. There, there is just a, uh, an affront to the truth that the lost people take today, even saved people uh, to some degree. They, they refuse to hear it. They just want to have this, well, yeah, but they believe something. The devil believes more than any saved man you know. The devil believes more than any lost group you know. But he's still not saved. It has to be faith in Christ and what he's done. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. If you look at Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 30, you know what that, that verse says? It says something so simple and so profound and so frightening that the child of God ought to read that verse over and over and over until they get it sealed in their, their head and in their heart. If your life doesn't match what the Bible says, if your match doesn't, uh, if your uh, testimony and your witness of your life and your daily existence doesn't equal what God's word says that it ought to be, you are in fact grieving the spirit of God that is sealed inside you. Now, I don't know about you, but I am carnal enough to want to be happy. And I tell you what, if you want to find a Christian life that's miserable, all you got to find is one that is not walking the way they ought to be walking. It's a life filled with fear, filled with frustration, filled with anger at other people. And uh, typically it's the people that are trying to get them to do right. It's a life that has no victories in it. It has only uh, uh, surrender on the, on the wrong side of that equation. Not surrendering to the Lord, surrendering to the world. When that Holy Spirit gets quenched, gets quieted, the fire that, and the zeal and the excitement. You think about your best day of being saved when you were so uh, excited about what God's done for you and maybe witnessing to somebody and they are just sucking that up like a sponge. And you think about the joy that's in your heart about this person's uh, maybe going to call on the Lord to get saved. And then you just think about that being a fire. You just take a bucket of water and pour it on there and put the thing out. And all that's left is just soot and smoke. And what was nice and warming and comfortable and reassuring before, all it leaves is something that if you touch it, it leaves a stain on you. It leaves a mark. Folks, that ought not to be our lives. Our lives ought to just be zealous for the Lord. It ought to be uh, just a, a happy life uh, serving God. One of a deep level of commitment that isn't a matter of uh, church or the preacher or what somebody's going to see or how people are going to look at you but just a love relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that just discounts what this world thinks about everything. You know, the Bible says in, uh, in Luke, the things that are highly esteemed among men are an abomination to God. You, you take the, the award ceremonies that this world has and all of the accolades that they heap on people. And God looks at that stuff and says, you know something? It'll burn. It, it's not, that's, that's nothing might be a great accomplishment. I'm not trying to diminish what it might mean to you, but in a proportional scale, it don't even, it don't even flicker on the charts. And yet this world goes to such great lengths to try and suck up to the world, be as much like the world as it can. Churches today are being patterned after 
nothing more than opinion polls of what does the world want will make a church like that. I think any church made like what the world wants would have to quench the Spirit of God. I think it would have to take that sealed spirit and just, just grieve him no end because it can't work out all of those things. First Thessalonians 5, 3, uh, 5, uh, 19 says simply, quench not the spirit. To quench something is that same thing. I like to make dyes, and one of the things that you do in that is there's a, uh, it's called a quenching process. In order to go from just mild steel, it has to be heated up to a point where it's uh, below melting, but far above its normal temperature. And you take that thing and you put it in, in uh, warm oil. And it takes that thing from uh, probably about 13, 14, 1500 degrees to probably about 120, 130 degrees in split seconds. You say, what is that? It's realigning every molecule in it. It's realigning all of the little, the little bits of stuff that that steel is composed of. And the better the composition in, the, in there, even with a raw material, the, the, the more tough that steel comes. But the opposite process seems to happen with the Spirit of God. It takes all those things, and when you quench that, it's already working. He's already working in you. What you do is just make life hard and brittle. That's not what God's intent is for us. We want to be pliable in God's hands. We want to be that weapon that God has formed for the defense of truth, for the integrity of of the word of God, for helping people, for delivering people from the bondage that they live in as lost human beings. And yet far too often, all we're worried about is, well, what does everybody else think of me? What, what if I do this and people think I'm weird and I think I'm a religious nut? I'm going to tell you a secret, my friend. People don't think about you that much. They think about themselves. They don't think about you and I. If they do, it's very brief. You know what? The Lord thinks about you all the time. There's not a thing that happens to you that is not concerned with. There's not a thing that happens to you. And, I, and the reason is, is because he has uh, one of those built-in transmitters, the Spirit of God, that has that line of communication to the Father set up perfectly, where it can take your temperature spiritually <laughs> in every other way. He can understand what you're going through so they can help you and give you the right uh, support, the right encouragement, the right group of people to be with while all those things are going on. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, look over there with me real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Let me back up to verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. We ought to be the ones glorying in God. Now he which establishes us with you is Christ, in Christ, and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. You know something, that, that sealing in that Spirit ought to be the kind of thing that forever we review. Every morning, every evening, we ought to be thinking about what's God given us? What, what great job has God laid before us that cannot be done in any way other than through the spirit of the living God? If we're not matching up with what that's done, it isn't, it isn't God that's deficient in his promise. All his promises are yea and in him, amen. It's us that are neglecting the things that the spirit of God is doing. Uh, look with me uh, over here in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Chapter 8 is interesting. Verse 1 starts out with a verse that is altered in every new Bible version. It's altered for one reason, so that you get the wrong idea about what God wants, what God is and who he is. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ. They all end there. 
Isn't that amazing? They left out the qualifier for that. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The reason is, is those are carnal books written for carnal men, carnal Christians, carnal people just in general, who like what they like, who want a God that can be manipulated and twisted and put into the form and to the shape that suits their mind. Listen, if you could, get, if you could have a God formed after your own mind, you'd have a God with no more intelligence or power than you. He couldn't save you. He couldn't seal you. He couldn't help you. He's just the product springing out of your own mind. All he could do is satisfy your flesh and your lust and desires. Look down here in verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. And they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded, you know, this it doesn't say to be carnal. To be carnally minded. A saved man can have a spiritual mind and he has a carnal mind. And it really comes down to back to, to Romans 6 and 7. To which mind are you going to yield? To which purpose are you going to endeavor in life to reach? What glory are you looking for? The glory of God in your life? The glory of heaven and the uh, eternal future with great rewards or just uh, just happy enough to, to get something here and grab onto the gravy train here. You know, we'll, we'll worry about all other stuff later. Yeah, but later is too late. That life that's uh, developing a future with you for Christ has to be lived now. So this, uh, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Anybody here want to have a peaceful life? Well, you know, it starts out there, uh, back in Romans chapter 5, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Peace with God always has to be held at a higher premium by uh, exponential numbers than peace with men. The Bible says simply, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. There are some people you just can't get along with after salvation. There are some people that they are, uh, by their nature, not peaceful. And you can aggravate yourself wanting to hang around with them. You can aggravate yourself fighting with them if you want. And you live that, that jagged, jangled, nerve-frayed kind of life. I don't know about you, but that ain't what I want. You know, people will say, well, you know, in every church there are cliques. Well, of course there are. There are people that want to serve God, and then there are people who want to come to church and go home and do whatever else they want to do. There are people in there that are caught up with the Lord, and they think about... Uh, what it says back in Malachi of God looking down on just on the people that thought on him or, or, or mentioned his name. And God's delighted in that. You want to be in that crowd. And then there's other people. Well, I'm saved. Where do you think the Holy Spirit is going to honor and glory in? I want to be in that crowd that the Lord looks down and says, they're mine. I'm pretty happy with that crowd there. Those other ones, I bought them. I'm glad God doesn't have buyer's remorse. Wouldn't that be something? God said, ah, that is, boy, that was a waste of... <laughs> you know, everybody has seen something at some point that they really wanted, and you, well, you did whatever it took to get it. And then you realize, boy, what a stupid move that was. You know what? A lot of people are trying to buy the world's favor. And if you get it, you're going to realize what a waste that was. Wasted life, wasted time, wasted fortune, wasted future. Romans 5 verse uh, 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. You know, most people don't realize how carnal their mind is. Because they hang around with so many other people that are just like themselves. And, uh, you know, you, I, I think a lot of people, they, well, I think I'm going to go to church. And they go to church and they find some preacher preaching the Bible. And they might have a, a, a flicker of conscience. And it might some of it might sound exciting. But you know what they think? Preacher is just mean. He, he just, he's not a very likable kind of guy. He just thinks he's better than everybody else. And, you know, he keeps talking about Jesus and, and truth and service and walk with God. I think I'm going to try that church down the road. 
where they have the Christmas tree and Santa Claus comes, has the kids sit on there, and it's all ho, ho, ho. Listen, if you've got a carnal mind, which one do you think you're going to sit in? That carnal mind delights in the things of the world. It delights in all of the things that titillate the flesh, the entertainment, the little drama club, all of the little things. Hey, listen, some of that stuff may be okay. All I'm saying is, is this, if that's what draws them, that's all carnal. And when the Lord tries to deal with them, it's just no. No. They're not going to be happy. Not in the Lord. They might be happy in church. They might be happy in the world. Carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh. Say, well, I am. Here it is. Well, it's either living after the flesh or living after the spirit. And it's to whom you yield yourself members to obey is whose servants you are. It's who you're serving. What are you doing? But you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit of so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. We've, we've been over that verse from probably 20 different angles. You know what that means? The day you trusted Christ, one of the things that happened to you is the Spirit of God moved into you and he took a possession of your soul and of your spirit. He didn't take possession of that flesh. And that soul has the option of following the Lord or following the flesh. And it really comes down to how happy do you want to be? Remember the song, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey? That obedience is not a forced kind of thing. It's not because we've got a church covenant that looks like a dictionary or an encyclopedia. It's simply a, a statement of faith. I believe that I'm born again by the power of the living God. I believe that I have everlasting life. And I want to live for that God. I want to serve that God that gave it to me. And it becomes a love affair with the Lord Jesus Christ. Far too many people never look at it like that. They look at it as sort of an obligation or a, a duty or some deep kind of dark thing that uh, has got to go on. In verse uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse, uh, verse 10, and if Christ be in you, boy, isn't that a scary thing? If, you, you go through that New Testament, every time that word if comes up, there's an option there. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. Well, let's just take a, a quick inventory. What if, the, what if that body isn't dead because Christ is in you? Well, now that body is raging. That body is alive and it's going to be the, the contrary to those things. So verse 11, but if the spirit of him, uh, excuse me, uh, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead, not will be dead, but is dead. Why? The reckoning of God, accounting this flesh to have no life in it, to have no power in it, to have no authority over me to make me do what can't please God. You realize that that, that spiritual victory, that everybody has the power of knowing, and I think few people ever even strive for the battle, for the fight. It's just kind of go along with whatever. Anytime I hear something I don't like, just kind of, Kind of quit there, throw the towel in. The Bible says that we're supposed to, to be uh, good soldiers of Jesus Christ. And if there's a battle going on, the implication is, is we, ought to, we ought to fight till there's no breath left in us for the truth and what's right. Just never give in. So he says, but the uh, verse 10, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. The spirit isn't life because you're a Baptist. It isn't right because you're an American and got a nice car. It's because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Our claim to victory, our claim to real life is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Talking about that back in Romans chapter 4, about the imputed righteousness that Jesus Christ takes from himself and lays on the heart and the shoulders of every saved man. I no longer live by any validation that I have for myself. 
I live because of what he's done for me. That's why the sealing of the Spirit of God is so important. It's what validates that I have everlasting life and that God's blessings are mine. I didn't earn them. I don't deserve them. I got a gift. I got life. I got a Spirit of God that can help me and lead me, guide me, provoke the truth in me. But it goes on. It says in verse 11, but preacher, I'm just weak. Preacher, I, I, don't, I didn't have a good education. Listen, take all your, your excuses, and uh, there, there's some little porcelain places in those rooms there on the back and the right. Throw them all in there, because God's not interested in excuses. He says, I've given you everything you need to do everything I've ever told you to do. It resides in you. That sealing of God's Spirit put all of the equipment, all of the power, all of the, the uh, essentials you need to know right in there. Verse 11 says, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, and it does if you're saved, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. No excuses. Well, I just didn't know. You got a Bible. Say, well, I can't read. A preacher. Well, I can't get to church. I can't help you there. Well, I just can't figure it out. I can help you a little bit, but you're going to need the Spirit of God to do that. But you don't know what it takes. It takes a willing heart. Uh, I've always... Uh, lived under the philosophy, uh, at least since salvation, and it became clear to me, you can't teach somebody something they don't want to know. That's just an impossibility. Their mind will be a million miles away while you're pouring out your heart, trying to show them something that will help them in, uh, forever. Not interested. But you take the simplest mind going, you know what they can learn? Every child that comes in this building, you know what they can learn at a very young age? The Lord Jesus Christ came down from heaven and he loves me. And if I just uh, have the right relationship with him, he will give me power to do everything he wants me to do. That's not particularly complicated. What that is, is just reassuring that it isn't based on how smart you are. It's based on, do you know him? Have you, has he saved you? Are you born again? And if you are, God put his spirit in you. And seal that spirit in. You know, the Bible says over in 1 Peter 1, 5, we are kept by the power of God. We're not kept by our good works. We're not kept by coming to church. We're not kept. Well, I read the Bible every day. And it's a King James Bible. Well, good. We're kept by the Spirit of God. He's the one that does all the work. All he says is, I just want you to join me. You just got to be willing to come along. When the Lord Jesus Christ over Matthew 11 says, Take, come, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen, you, you put a, an elephant and a, a chihuahua in a yoke to pull a, pull a, a plow. Who do you think is going to do all the work? Yeah. That, you know, that's what most people seem to think. Oh, I'm just, it's so, it's so hard. Then you're not in the yoke with them. You get in the yoke with him, that little chihuahua's feet aren't even on the ground. He's being carried along by a power so much greater than himself. I remember reading a little illustration one time, and it was talking about how we think of ourselves as opposed to, to how things really are. And an elephant's walking down the road, and he, this little ant blows out of a tree, and he lands on this elephant's back. He said, wow, this is pretty good. Got a good view up here. I'm not looking up at everything from the ground. I'm looking down at everything. But this is really good. And he started walking across this bridge, and that bridge is shaking really bad. And that ant kind of looks around. And he says, boy, we're really making this bridge shake. And that's sometimes what we think. We're really shaking things up. No, the best thing we can do is just be so bound to the Lord Jesus Christ that when he shakes things up, we get a little tingle from it. We get a little excitement from it and just glad to be along for the ride. Glad that he's keeping us. Glad that he's sealed himself as his, his spirit in us and given us all of the things that, that make for life. Verse uh, 
12 says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors. You know, every now and then people think, well, what's it going to cost me to get saved? Well, it's going to cost you everything. Well, let me ask you a question. What do you think it's going to cost you to stay lost? Well, yeah, you can't count up that cost. It's eternal and it's total. That's why God spoke about people who died without Christ as perishing. There's nothing left of them. Might as well be nothing. We're debtors, not to the flesh. This won't help you in Christ. To live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. That's what we're talking here. You got saved and the, the first thing God did is put his Spirit inside you. And lock that Spirit in, never to come out. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You know, some people seem to think, God is so lucky that I got saved. He can really, he'll really be better off with somebody like me. Hard to believe that, isn't it? Come on, you felt like that. You know, our, our thoughts ought to really be how kind of God to save me. How merciful, how gracious of God to step out of glory where all the angels of God are worshiping and going down the dusty streets of Jerusalem bearing a cross for me so that he could die for my sins and I could live. And beyond that, putting his very spirit in my heart to give me joy and power and life and fulfillment and excitement and a hope that the Bible says fadeth not away. And the world says, no, I believe something. Well, if you don't believe that, I'm sorry, but whatever it is you believe is very ineffective. You got to find out what God says you ought to believe. Let me, let me go through a list of things here. You know what we got? When that spirit comes to dwell inside, he's given you a spiritual mind. The Bible says over in 1 Corinthians uh, 2, about verse 16 or 17, we have the mind of Christ. Now listen, lest you think you're Kenneth Copeland or one of them other TV heretics, that doesn't mean, okay, now you're a creator God. That doesn't mean, okay, now I can just speak to my, uh, my estate and I'll be rich. What that means is uh, if, if I wrote Donna a letter, about uh, something I wanted done. And I said, I want it done this way, this way, and this way. She could pick up that letter and say, well, I have the mind of Pastor Smith. He's told me everything he wants done about this and the way that it should be done and all that kind of stuff. When we have the mind of Christ, you know what this book is? This book illustrates the mind of Christ. And we have that in a... a uh, infallibly preserved form so that no man could ever get to heaven and say, I didn't know. The best he could say is, Lord, I didn't want to know. I ignored your Bible. I stayed out of church. I lived my life trying to make everybody in the world happy and trying to get along with everybody. I just wanted to be a nice person. You know, the Bible does say, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And God's going to say, you should have put that in that porcelain receptacle. Because that's just a lazy, good for nothing excuse. And I'm not buying it. You're the one that said that the Lord's a hard, austere man. Taking up that which he laid not down. No, he's not. He's loving and gracious and kind and helpful, encouraging. And every provision he's made is so that you and I could have that spiritual mind that is necessary. We are now subject to a law in a different way. Before that law would have killed us. But the Bible says the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Far too many people don't learn anything from the law. They look at that law and says, well, I don't have to obey the law. 
Listen, if your father is a judge, and if he's an honest judge, and you violate the law, guess what? You're still guilty. And if he's real honest, you're going to pay the penalty for whatever that is. That law has enabled us to live those things without the force of the, uh, the uh, letters in, in granite, but just impressed upon the heart so that we don't offensive to a holy God. We uh, have been given that uh, sealing of the Spirit so that we can please God. You know, the Bible says the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You know what that double-mindedness is? That's me on Sunday morning. I am committed. I am in. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to walk with the Lord. And then Sunday night, forgetting it. Well, I'll just stay home and watch television. I'll just do whatever. Double-minded man says... Well, you know, Jesus loves me. I, I, it's okay. I can do whatever I want. And the carnal mind says, yeah, we don't need to do that. Them other people, they're, they're whatever they are. We, we know we're okay. Yeah, but do you do what's okay out of love for the Lord or out of a convenience for the flesh? Just to get along? Or is it something that God's compelling? You know, we, sometimes we, I think we think we're really pulling one over on God. And it's, well, nobody else knows, so it's okay. Nobody else matters. It's between you and I, uh, uh, you and I, it's between us and the Lord. If we're pleasing him, nobody else rises to that level of concern. And if we're not pleasing the Lord, nobody else is important enough to think about. We ought to be pleasing him. We're not living lives simply to cater to the flesh. Listen, this old flesh, I'm, uh, I guess I'm as carnal as uh, uh, a man could be when I want to live in a nice warm house. I want to eat food. I, I like to, to have clothes that keep me warm and look halfway decent. I, I like a lot of those things. That's right. But you can't let those things control your lives against what God wants for you. Or all of a sudden, your appetite has destroyed you. Don't let your belly be your God. And the, that implication over in Philippians is all you're concerned about is that old flesh. Just fill up your belly with whatever it is. Fill up your heart with this world. Fill up your mind with this world's garbage. Go along with all that kind of junk. And every time something spiritual comes along, criticize it. Because you realize that's not what I'm looking for. Going through this world dead but alive. Isn't that an amazing dichotomy? The more alive you are to this world, the deader you are to God. And the deader you are to this world, the more alive you are to God. You know, it's where our priorities lie. God's sealed spirit inside of us says, uh, I, you ought to be living for the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, the life that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. This world didn't give anything for me. This world takes it doesn't provide. It takes. It doesn't promise. It robs. We ought to be living in Christ. We ought to be debtors to Christ. And we ought to be led by his spirit. This, this idea of being a child of God is not one of, of licentiousness. I can live any way I want because I'm saved. It's the idea of I'm a child adopted into a family, and that family is so different than the one I came out of. My family before Christ was, every one of them were on their way to hell. Every one of them were going to burn for their sins. Every one of them was whatever they thought of themselves in their own mind. When I got in Christ, all those children are destined to be holy. The Bible says, I am holy, be ye holy. Well, that seems like a pretty steep commitment. Of course it is. Our Father's holy. He saved us so we could be holy. He saved us from the law so the law could be in us, but not trying to condemn us. He saved us so we could love us and have a fellowship with us. Listen, there's not a, an, an adult with children in this room, and you think that no matter how bad your children are, you're enjoying that? You love your children. 
but you don't want them to be bad. You don't want them to do something other than what's right because then you have to discipline them. You want them to do right so you can bless them and give them a good life and always be happy with them. That doesn't seem like a far stretch for us to want, is it? That, that The idea of living for Jesus, living for the Spirit of God's peace and comfort in our hearts, that ought to be a pretty lofty goal, and it's one easily reached because it's by the power of God. And the same power the Bible said we just read that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead, that's, that's pretty good power. That's in you. The simplest child of God, that same power is in you. We should be completely without excuse of why we don't live right. Well, it's because of this person. Get away from that person. Well, it's because of that job. Get away from that job. You're going to do whatever's important to you. You want to be happy? I'll tell you what, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you today. Ask that you bless God as we uh, move from the Sunday school into the uh, song service and preaching. God, we just would ask that you would have your way in our hearts and lives. Lord, we thank you for the folks gathered, for the young folks gathered. Pray, God, that you'd encourage and strengthen. Lord, help us to be a kind of people that would just bring glory and honor and praise to you. Lord, I am so selfish and uh, thoughtful of myself. I want to be that happy. And there's no other way than to make you happy first. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for providing your spirit the, the second we trust you to lead us and guide us into all joy and peace forever. In Jesus' name, amen.